Welcome back guys, hope you're good. Today, we are gonna be on and off. I'm pleased to say that the, uh, the block I live in has said that we can put our food waste in the bin store, but it hasn't happened yet. But today, I wanna show you behind these gates. A couple of years ago, I did some moments conversations in that building and I looked behind there and I thought that looks like an interesting car park. I called Robin and then spoke to Hannah at the Community Brain and said, if you've got access to this car park, they did some inquiries, they found out that they do for two years before they end up rebuilding this block. And I said, I would love to make that car park a community hub. And now, six months later, it's finally getting started. We've got the community fridge in here, community forge in there, a carpentry workshop. In here is the river adventure station for kayaks and boats. And this is my little boat that Chloe bought me when we got engaged. It's beginning to take shape. That I can show you in here. Look at this workshop. Keep tidy. <laughs> it's an absolute dream for me to be able to share tools, share space. Already, Will, the forge man from the Kingston University, has used my kayak wheels and they've been helping me think about how to take the boat electric. I've had wood from wilderness farm up here making stuff for the wedding it's just an amazing melting ground of both community creativity and getting utility out of the farm as well we're gonna go to the farm pick some stuff up got a delivery but i want to talk about some stuff about what's going on with ai chat gpt and who we think we are make another video in here on a weekend because that's when it gets really busy saturdays and sundays because that's when people come with their hobby time their time for the amour the amateur love of creativity Let's go. Strange tents arrived, but looks a bit big for the gate. The rugs, the poles, and the canvas, well, the bag. It's good. It's good. I still have wow. So much it's a big ass carpet. It's kind of exciting to think about making these things. I mean, we could make these poles. Have to figure out some textile stuff. Maybe we can speak to Sonaz about some rough textiles for carpets and canvases. Maybe we could do a collab, wilderness tents. I still have some places to return. I still have the wisdom. And the little eggs, tiny little eggs in, in a nest. They look like mini eggs. <laughs> I hope my mum comes back for them. It's only a oh. This is the first time I'm trying Alfie's coffee bags. Sweet. It's only a Three minutes. Three minutes in heaven's better than one minute in heaven. Need some new strings for the guitar. A little wine rack sorted. So let's go. There we go. Better. This is going to be the boot room, the kind of hallway. Take your shoes off, come into the kitchen, and into my office for the day. I'm excited. Cheers. We're finally getting there. I want to talk about some big stuff today. I want to start introducing a conversation about AI. You might remember that about six years ago, I did some lectures at UCL University on the nature of intelligence because it was obvious that this AI journey was coming and now it's here with ChatGPT. So it's a very real conversation for all of us to think about what does this mean for us and our skills and our lifestyle? Is it good for us? Shall we work with it? I've said in an education conference in Spain about what does it mean to be human? I talked about this being the biggest change of our relationship with the food chain since we discovered fire. And already, in just a few weeks of using GPT-3 and 4, developers are talking about being four and five times more efficient. So we are just in the preamble of artificial general intelligence. In my lectures five years ago, I believed that DeepMind already crossed that boundary, but now we're beginning to see it at play at large. I also made a video with the head of AI at NASA, and we talked about the nature of work and how a lot of people think that AI is going to manifest first and foremost in robots and therefore and therefore eating out all of the work 
that we would do with our bodies. There's three phases of any piece of work. There's the ideation, what do we want, and actually setting out to do something in the world. Then there's the detail planning, strategy, logistics, there's ordering, there's putting into place... There's executing the plan and then there's the final soft touches. And in that conversation at NASA, and I can see it now with GPT, the reverse is happening. Work is being eaten out from the middle. And what will be left for us humans, I believe, is pure ideation, being able to say what do we want and agreeing on that. And the final final furlong, the soft touch. And that's obvious in industries like in the performance of poetry or in massage or in therapy at the very extremes of what it means to connect socially as human beings. I think what this is bringing into focus is something else that I discussed in my series on beautiful irrationality. It's the question of who are we? What is the branding of humanity? And you may have read Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. That branding is, is obviously the most long-standing human branding about us being the most intelligent. And it wasn't our strength or our speed that got us to the top of the food chain. It was our intelligence, our ability to tell stories and build tools and therefore work collectively in order to take on bigger challenges. Even now, I think there's enough glimmers in GPT-4 that we can imagine a future where we're not the most intelligent organism or engine in the known universe. And so people are beginning to think again about who are we? Rutger Bregman, who got famous at Davos, thinks that we are homo puppy, the friendliest species. Some think we are homo faber, the species that controls our environment through tools. Homo economicus is the dominant view that we've been seeing through capitalism, although we've fallen out of love with it through behavioural economics. Homo habilis, similar to Faber, the handyman. And just a couple of days ago on Lex Friedman's podcast, I came across Max Tegmark's Homo sentience. As the humans will continue to human, AI will just be a medium that enables the human experience to flourish. I would phrase that as rebranding ourselves from Homo sapiens <laughs> to Homo sentience. Branding ourselves as the smartest yeah. information processing entity on the planet. That's clearly going to change if AI continues ahead. So maybe we should focus on the experience instead, the subjective experience that we have. That's what's really valuable. The love, the connection, the other things. And get off our high horses and get rid of this hubris that you know, only we can do integrals. So consciousness, the subjective experience is a fundamental value to what it means to be human. Make that the priority. That feels like a hopeful direction to me, but that also requires more compassion, not just towards other humans because they happen to be the smartest on the planet, but also towards all our other fellow creatures on this planet. If you haven't read Life 3.0, it's a brilliant book, and I think he's a very wise philosopher, thinking very carefully about the risks of AI if we let it just roam. What Tegmark says is that our ability to have conscious subjective experience, to be here, present, to be aware of being in this moment with you, is the most important thing about us. To me, all of these definitions say something about who we are. But if we're to say just one thing about who humans are in their best moments, I don't think any of these capture it. I even saw in TechCrunch this week a new conference with only 40 people called The Learning Man. A whole conference, a culture they're trying to cultivate around the idea that we need to be lifelong learners. Which again is a response to this idea that we have to continue to adapt constantly in the face of a greater intelligence for the first time in our whole human history. And if you move out of philosophy and into theology, Christians would argue that it is sacrificial love that is our most important attribute when we absorb the essence of that archetype of Jesus Christ. I put it to you that the thing that differentiates us, the thing that humans do in our best moments that is completely unique to all the other animals and all the machine intelligence that's coming is in the beauty of the biological limits that we have this embodied experience we have an ability to create with great love i believe we are the creatrix amorum the creatrix means this sort of feminine giving birth to new life and the amorum is a plural sense of we do it for the love and sometimes we create things and then love them and sometimes we love things and then create with them but this connection between the two is fundamental 
in the way that we have embodied agency in the world. And when our most free and capable, when we are thriving and flourishing the most, we do it with great love. And that's how I want my life to be seen, is that I was someone that dared to act with great creativity and love. We need the hablis, the faber, the puppy, the economicus, the sentience. But ultimately, all of those are in and around, put to work in this creative unfolding of us loving and creating the life and the world that we are in. That's who I am. I am Dave Erasmus, one of the Creatrix Amorum. That's how I want to design my life. That's who I believe you are. It's in this mode of us understanding our humanity that we create the best art and adventure and love. This is the stuff that moves us, that leads to magical moments, which leads on to remarkable memories and leads to a life well lived. What does it mean to encourage each other in creativity and love, to love creativity, to creatively love, to weave those things between each other in a thousand different ways? I think the reason that people put words to their idea of what God is, is for convenience. It's to be able to take something that can be difficult to tune into and be able to put it on their shelf, to be able to brand their version of God so that others can see it and catch it as a meme. I think there can be some usefulness and convenience in that, but I also acknowledge that if I were to ever stray into the realm of theology of describing what God is, again, it would just be as a reflection of who I think we are in our best moments. So I can say that we are the homo creatrix amorum, and I want to help you to live out of that essence as much as possible and design a system of society that supports that. And I can also project that up into my sense of deus creatrix amorum, the God who is the creator that loves. And so... What the hell do we do with AI with all of that said? Well, I'm really excited to tell you that today our experiment with Google has finally gone live. The project that we presented at COP27. Well, scientists are taking a deep dive into protecting coral reefs in the world's oceans. As CBS's Ian Lee reports, if you're willing to listen, there's a way you can help. Researchers are asking people to put their ears to the ocean to help save the world's coral reef under growing threat from climate change, pollution, and overfishing. It's a whole sonic world that we're not aware of, so it's like really exciting to try and find out what all these sounds mean. Marine biologist Mary Shadipo and her team dove deep to capture hundreds of hours of coral sounds in marine protected areas around the globe. Google is helping scientists sift through the audio with an online platform anyone can access. All the listening is aimed at uncovering different sounds of marine life to help track illegal mining and pinpoint areas in need of revitalization. The same sound can mean a different thing if they change color. There's all these like nuances in the sounds that we want to know about so we understand what's happening, how they're communicating. Scientists say as more people give their ears to the project, the eyes of the world will be open to the importance of protecting the beauty below. Ian Lee, CBS News, London. It's live. Go check it out. Tell us what you think. There's going to be plenty more coming from us on Listening to the Oceans. We've been able to bridge the gap between the science and the corporates, and now we're going to carry on the innovation journey. We've got lots of cool projects coming up this year. It's nice to do this. Nice to get it into the heart of the narrative at COP27. And now we're getting our thinking caps on with a few partners about how to take it to the next level and actually do some really solid, innovative science. Back to the farm. Also on Friday night, Acoustic went into the BBC documentary, Our Changing Planet. I'll see if I can rob up a clip and stick it in here so you can see Steve in action. <laughs> These are some wooden poles from the building site nearby. What this is, is effectively is a human listening device with our ears now spread a metre and a half apart. And what we've got here are four hydrophones. So that'll mean that we can start to listen to the reef in surround sound. Four of these hydromoths in a square, about two metres apart, and then put a 360 degree camera in the middle of it. And when we hear a sound, we can then turn our screen to look at which species was making that sound. Steve only developed this setup a few weeks ago. So we're all excited to see how it works in the field. 
So I'm calling it the laugh high, low, low. Okay. So then if I go into the video, we're looking for a fish arriving and producing the sound. And it's this guy here. So the, the regal angel fish swims in. So it's a really nice way of actually being able to put some characters into the soundscape for the first time. That's extraordinary. It's like you recorded a, a bird song for the first time in the 21st century. <laughs> We're a long way behind underwater, but it means we can listen with our eyes open. It's so exciting. This feels pretty special to me. Th these are fish I don't think a human has ever heard before, species that have never been recorded. So this really is a pioneering adventure into the soundscapes of coral reefs. You're talking about playing the sounds of a, a perfect, pristine reef as a kind of calling card as a, as a come hither to floating coral larvae that's that's the plan and over probably two or three generations two or three seasons you start to then make that coral reef its own loudspeaker again i guess the one thing i forgot to say was that this google experiment doesn't actually use ai although we did meet with some senior ai people at google but I've realized that for us to have the flexibility and integrity that we need to make sure that we protect and scale that intelligence engine for the oceans, we need to do it ourselves. We are building now acoustics.com, acoustics with a Q, this engine that will help us annihilate the cost of processing underwater data. And so for me, and I got this from Max Tegmark, but that's what AI is for. It's for doing work we don't want to do or helping us explore further than we can on our own to create a better world, to work with the environment, not to destroy our lives and to take our jobs unnecessarily. So there is room for AI, even in this organic, biological, analog world. We've just got to be super careful about how we use it. I think that's it for me today. Every day, it gets a little bit better, a little bit further on. Soon we'll have the glamping tents out. We're going to be in a whole world of glory. I'll see you guys very soon. Check out the links below. Take care of yourselves, look after each other, and find ways to embrace your creative and loving true essence in your best moments. Ciao.